right, thank you. Uh, it's nice to talk to a bunch of people I don't normally get a chance to talk to. Um, I should start with a confession. Um, I'm not a geologist. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and the reason why I'm standing up here talking to you hopefully will become apparent as we go forward. So at UWA, we have this thing called the CMCA, um, which is the Center for Microscopy Characterization and Analysis. A very long name for a facility that's designed to look at very small things. And we're sitting at the moment on about $55 million worth of capital infrastructure that's spread across the campus and within the Medical Research Institute. And supporting that, we have about 35 staff. And our real goal is to support researchers at the university, and we support over 500 different groups a year, uh, trying to support their high-end research needs. Uh, the staff of the center are critical to this. Um, so you'll see some of the facilities in a moment, but the staff that support them have a huge technical knowledge of all the different techniques, and we have experts in all the different areas. But more importantly, perhaps, for some of the things you guys might, might, might be interested in, uh, most of our staff come with a very strong research background. Uh, so most of the staff, regardless of how they're employed at the university, um, have PhDs. And they come from a diverse range of backgrounds. Uh, so you'll hear from two of my colleagues after the coffee break, and they are both geoscientists. Uh, but we have people from medical backgrounds and bioscience backgrounds and all kinds of things. And it's incredible what that melting pot of backgrounds and ideas can bring when people turn up with different research problems. Uh, so we believe for us that it's, it's more than just a bunch of shiny pieces of metal. Um, it's more about the people that support them. So within the center, uh, we've recently restructured um, so we have three what are now being called clusters. One is looking at medical imaging, one is doing biological mass spec, and the other one is what's called microscopy and analysis. And since August, I've been the uh, facility director for that. Uh, I've been at UWA since 2001 in various capacities, but took on the leadership role for this uh, a few months ago. And What's contained within the microscopy and analysis cluster, similar to what Mark was showing uh, within CSIRO, are a diverse range of platforms that can deliver different information on different length scales. Um, we're talking everything from micro through nano down to atomic. And within the things that we have, there are some unique things. Uh, so after the coffee break, if I can find a pointer... I found a pointer? No, nope, I've lost the pointer. So the ion probes, which Law will talk about after the break, are unique in the Southern Hemisphere. And part of the funding for one of those probes, as Mark commented, came through, uh, through the C funding. Um, we've got standard X-ray diffraction. Um, we have X-ray CT, uh, as others have spoken about, and I'll speak about again. And we have an extensive electron microscopy platform as well. One of the key things for us with having all this instrumentation is it's all co-located. So you don't need to move more than about 300 meters to go from one instrument to the next. And most of it's all sitting on one corridor. So, so we'll, we'll claim we'll, we'll trump Mark's slide of things on different sides of the country. Um, it's amazing that we can put all of these things uh, together in one place. The sorts of information we can deliver because it's similar to what other people have been talking about. We can start at the light microscopy end and just look at basic microstructures. We can take you through the 3D microstructures and porosities uh, using X-ray CT, um, the large electron microscopy facility, which will do everything down as far as the atomic scales, um, the electron microprobes, which we have the only probes in WA, and Malcolm will talk about those after the coffee break. The iron probes, as we said, providing isotopic imaging and analysis, and those being unique southern hemisphere. Um, a few uh, months ago, uh, after I took on my role, we've taken over management of UWA's geoscience ICP mass spec facility. Uh, and say XRD, we can throw in scan probe microscopy. If you want access to NMR, we do that as well. Um, and, of course, we can do all the sample prep that goes with it. 
Uh, so running along the bottom of this slide is, is sort of the graphic of all the things that we can bring to the party, uh, what's seen as the, uh, the workflow for us from engaging with you to get the ideas out, planning everything, we can provide training, we can do a lot of data collection, and we can see the whole thing through the analysis all the way through to uh, if it's university research, of course, through to publications, or for you guys delivering uh, an outcome that you require. And now, our principal role, of course, being a UWA facility, is to make UWA better than it is at the moment. We're there to support UWA researchers. We do that for researchers from across everything from physics, chemistry, engineering, biology, but we have a strong geoscience uh, support. Um, but we're a bit more than just supporting UWA. Uh, there is an agreement in place that links to some of the things that Mark said, which allows access and shared facilities between UWA, Curtin, CSIRO, ECU, Murdoch, are all part of this agreement. And we're also part of a national grouping of microscopy facilities um, through the federal government's uh, NCRIS program, which means that all of our facilities are accessible to all publicly funded researchers on the same terms. So it doesn't matter whether you're at UWA or not. Um, the other thing, of course, is we can deal direct with industry, and that is an important reason we exist. Um, a large focus of federal government funding these days is on us engaging with industry. And so we can engage with your community in two ways. We can do it by working directly with you, or if you are working with university-based researchers uh, in earth science schools and so on, then those people can act as a conduit because they're all able to access our facilities on these terms. The sorts of things that we could deliver for you, and there's a range of things we could do. Some people will come to us because they've got a problem, and the question is, what's the best way to solve the problem? Now again, because we've got such a range of different instrumentation and the expertise in those different things, all sitting close together, we talk to each other. And so perhaps instead of being stuck with the technique because it's the only technique available to you locally, um, in our case, we will sort of perhaps direct you to the best solution, which may well not be something that you thought of because within the university environment, maybe we've got different facilities to what would be available perhaps in a commercial analytical laboratory. We can just train your people to use the instruments. Um, several companies in WA have been quite clever over the last couple of years and have been hiring PhD students that we've already trained and then sending those students back to us as commercial clients. Um, those people, of course, can already run the instruments. They know what they're doing. And so all they're doing is paying for instrument time, which is relatively cheap, and off they go. Um, some people will get data. They don't know what it means. Of course, we've got the knowledge and the expertise in the data processing. And if you want us to, we can provide an analytical service. Uh, perhaps this will not be what you would expect to get from a commercial lab. We're not going to turn samples around in, in two hours. Um, but being in the university environment that we are, some of the value add that we can bring to the research perhaps is a bit different to just providing a, a routine analytical service. The other one that we can do is perhaps build more into this. I mean, Mark mentioned, you know, for the Maya Mapper, they like to, build, to work with people in terms of research projects. And of course, this is a big opportunity for us as well. Uh, we have sources of students, and so we can design projects. We can support PhD projects and all things like this. But also, we can get you access to other sources of funding uh, to help support your work. Um, so if you've got longer-term ideas, then things like the ARC, uh, the Australian Research Council Linkage Project, uh, is a useful way to do that, where the federal government will put in most of the money to do the research, and you only need to put in a small amount of that. But this is more for projects that are going to run over two or three years, not something where you need an instant result. So my colleagues will talk about two of the core uh, facilities that are supporting geoscience after the coffee break, but they can't cover everything. So I'm going to talk about three of the other areas briefly, just to give you an idea about some of the things we've got. 
Um, as I said, recently we've taken over the ICP mass spec facility. Um, I've been warned by the person who gave me the next few slides that you guys are going to know more about this than I am, so I'm going to be very careful. Um, so this facility um, and set of instruments was originally set up supporting uh, a high-end research group at UWA, and recently the university decided to make this facility more accessible, more open access and more usable by the outside community. And so they've moved it under my management. And so these uh, set of instruments are sitting in a custom-built, clean, clean laboratory environment um, so they can provide accurate, high-quality data and are supported then by a mixture of academic and technical staff. Again, the technical staff member has a PhD from Cambridge, so we have that high level of research knowledge as well. And talking about doing element analysis now at PPB and even parts per trillion level, and, and doing it quite quickly uh, using the laser ablation. Um, I like pictures of things rather than words, so these are some of the facilities that we have. Uh, so multiple different instruments, and the laser can be wheeled around and attached to different instruments depending on what you want to do. We're currently in the process of trying to expand this facility to provide uh, more capability. Um, and the sorts of experiments being done, uh, a lot of geochronology being done, um, and talking about resolutions down to tens of microns. Uh, in this case, um, I was told to highlight the fact it only took them one to two hours to get a very, very, very accurate result. Um, but the other thing that they wanted to uh, emphasize is, again, because the ICP facility is sitting alongside all of the other facilities that we have, like scanning electron microscopy, like optical microscopy, like the facilities that we hear about after the coffee brick, we can build in the workflow very effectively to be able to take samples from one facility to the next facility to the next facility so you can get the correlative information from the same sample uh, with great ease uh, without too much effort. So the other example they've given me is, is really trace element analysis. In this case, very rapid analysis, 30 to 60 seconds per analysis point, and lots and lots of data points, therefore, to build up the statistics of what's going on. Uh, so, let's say, this is quite new to me, to have the ICP facility in with us, and we're really now looking how to integrate that into the workflow with some of the other facilities that we have within the center. So we also run X-ray CT or X-ray microscopy, depending on which company you buy them from as to what they call them. Um, we're running facilities looking at standard materials, rocks, semiconductors. We also run an instrument that looks at live animals um, up at the hospital. And so we have a range of different interests in the X-ray CT. Um, we've got the same one that Mark showed except we bought ours about six months after they did. So this is a what picture of it with the doors shut looks like. And so you're talking about now sample sizes of several centimeters. Um, if you make the sample small enough, we're talking about resolutions, we can get down to about half a micron. Um, and again, as Mark said, looking at the variations in composition by looking at variations in the absorption of the x-rays, but also you'll show up cracks, pores, and other features internally to the system. So we're doing quite a bit of work here looking at just grain shape, mineral shapes, relationships. Um, we're starting to do quite a bit of work on porosity. And again, we're talking now about not just pulling out pretty pictures, but actually pulling out numerical information. So in addition to the staff I have supporting the instrument and making sure the data is correct, um, we also have staff whose research interest is the data itself and developing analytical techniques, visualization techniques, looking at things like pore sizes, interconnectivities, uh, and all these sides of things. So we can value add onto the project that way. Um, this is our version of what's inside the box. It, it's actually very simple. On, on the one side is just an x-ray source, in the middle is a sample, and on the other side is a camera. So literally turn on x-ray source, stick sample in the middle, take picture. 
and then steadily rotate the sample until we get enough pictures. This is the fun. Do the videos run? The videos run. We win. So this was the closest I could get to looking at a core sample. Um, so this was somebody's rock core from the University of Sydney. And so the video that's running is just showing slices from the top to the bottom after it's been reconstructed. Um, I keep watching this and thinking the whole thing's rotating. It, it's not rotating. These are all um, nice plate-like minerals that are running in different directions. And so having acquired all the data, which took them about a couple of hours, I think, to acquire this data set, uh, the fun came in then in terms of all the processing. And so pulling out orientation relationships, sizes, and all of that. So we're doing quite a bit of this. We're doing quite a lot now uh, in soil science, looking at porosities in soil cores, um, trying to understand how fertilizers get in, how water gets through, how nutrients get through. And the other example, um, so these samples come from a project with Bill Griffin and Macquarie, which was looking at gem deposits in Israel. And there's all kinds of weird and wonderful things inside these samples, which are leading to several controversial research papers and fights. Um, so here is a grain of hibernite, and growing inside that is this lovely dendritic structure of pure vanadium. And so here we see oh, the other ones decided to start as well. And so again, visually we get the pretty picture, but what we're interested in is pulling out things like the fractal dimensions of some of these branches. Um, we're applying similar uh, models to this data that we're also applying to vasculature in the human heart and neurons in brain cells and all kinds of things. And so there's a lot of commonality between the ideas of what we see in different techniques and how we process. Again, one of the fun things about having this facility sitting at one end of the corridor and many of the other things as we go along the corridor is you can use the technique, identify a smaller region of interest, and then polish through to it, cut it out, extract it for some other kind of analysis so that we can do, the, again, that correlative work throw from 3D into 2D analysis techniques. The other technique I will mention briefly, because it's somewhat close to my heart, is we have quite a large electron microscopy facility. Um, so mixtures of instruments, so we have several scanning electron microscopes. Um, we have currently two TMs. We will be, uh, we'll end up with three transmission electron microscopes by the end of next year. Um, point out the whole, whole capability here is led by one of UWA's leading researchers. Um, very charismatic. Um, and we also have the FIB SEM, um, and I'll show you why that's very useful for our workflow uh, in a moment. Um, so again, the whole electron microscopy facility is pff, somewhere over 20 million worth of instruments. Um, and we're talking about some of the best performed instruments in the country. So in terms of the scanning electron microscopy, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this. Then we're talking about imaging down to the nanometer scale. Um, the very nice instrument that's in the top corner can actually image down to four angstrom. Um, so it's one of the highest resolution instruments on the planet. Um, and then talking about element analysis at the submicron scale. So here just using backscatter imaging to identify variations in composition within the sample and using x-ray, uh, using energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, uh, as Malcolm will explain after the coffee break, to look at the compositions in all of this. That's fine. The scanning electron microscope will get us a long way. But then the question comes, what happens if we want to be able to go beyond that and look at things in higher detail? Um, one of the nice things now is the availability of these FIB SEMs. There's one at Curtin. We have another one at UWA, and so it's a scanning electron microscope, but attached to it is an ion column. So the focused ion beam is the FIB, and so what we can do is we can use the SEM side of it image, we can find the feature of interest, and we can use the ion beam as an excavating tool. 
And so in this case, what we're doing is looking at a set of particles. And we go, we're interested in this particle here that's sitting on the surface of, of this sample. And what we'd like to do is look at that in much more detail than we can with the SEM. And so what we've done is the particle is sitting under here. And what we've done is we've put some protective platinum over the top of it. And then we've used the iron beam to cut a trench either side. And then slowly we've cut out around the outside. And then you bring in a little needle. We weld the needle onto our tiny piece of sample. And we cut out the side and we can lift this out. And ultimately we can attach it to a support and we can thin this sample down. So the sample we're ending up with here is, yeah, maybe 20 microns wide, 10 microns deep, and 100 nanometers thick. So you might wonder, why do we bother um, going to all this effort to end up with such a tiny piece of material? Um, if you want to work with me, you need to bother. Uh, I'm the TEM person. Because what we then do is we take that sample, we walk across the corridor, and we put it in my nice $4 million TEM. And what we can then do with the TEM is change your length scale. We're now imaging down to the atomic scale. So the picture in the top right-hand corner, the little white and black dots are actually the rows of atoms in the sample. So we can do direct imaging crystallography. You see a feature in your sample. I can give you the crystallography of it. You want to see the relationship between one grain and the grain next door. We can use the fib to cut a, a cross-section across that grain boundary. Then we can use this to image what's happening exactly at the same grain boundary. We can do element analysis, but because the sample is now so thin, I'm now doing element analysis at very close to atomic resolution. So easy for identifying large, for me this is large, half a micron, um, large mineral phases like this titanium diboride. But if you wanted to look at much smaller inclusions, you wanted to look at diffusion profiles, you wanted to look at reactions at grain boundaries, now we can go across all of that length scale. And then in the corner is the diffraction pattern from the same object. And again, unlike doing XRD and then going, OK, these phases are in there. I wonder where they are and trying to relate them. We're pulling out the whole story from here. It's an interesting one for me. I joined UWA in 2001, long before the age of the FIB. And for probably the first decade I worked at UWA, the only geoscience people I worked with were soil scientists because they were working on clay minerals, iron oxide nanoparticles, and making a TEM sample from them was easy. You put particles in a liquid, you shake it up, you put a droplet onto a substrate, you put it in the microscope, because they're thin. I didn't work with anyone, no, what I, what I, nobody that what I'd call real geology, no hard rocks. And that's because we couldn't make samples. We couldn't do the analysis that they wanted. And really, once we got the FIB and then added the TEM with it, um, now I do quite a significant amount of work with geoscientists. Um, I pretend to be a geoscientist quite a lot of the time. So that was a quick overview with three of the techniques. You'll hear about two more later. Um, just in a way to bring us to a conclusion, um, we'd be very happy to talk. Right? We're very interested in talking to people, building relationships with industry, whether it be directly with us or if you've already got existing collaborations with people in the earth science departments within any of the WA universities, they can also approach us in the same way. Um, to remind you about the plethora of information we could provide, we're talking about everything from millimeter scale to atomic scale. We're talking about the ability to correlate that information from instrument to instrument. And we're talking about every single one of these platforms being supported by someone who has an international research reputation um, of working in that field and solving research problems in that individual field. And those people coming with different research backgrounds, including some of them in geoscience. Uh, because you're able to download a copy of the presentation, I threw in several emails. Um, I managed to get myself in twice because I have two jobs. Um, I run the electron microscopy facility and now I run the entire facility. Uh, but please feel welcome. Uh, you'll hear from Malcolm and you'll hear from Law um, shortly. Uh, Tony Kemp is an academic in 
uh, Science at UWA who is working very heavily with the ICP. Um, but as we say, these facilities are accessible. Um, it's a huge investment sitting in WA and we would love to see them taken up to support some of the activities that you guys are working from. Um, I'm supposed to acknowledge all the people that provide money and so I will put up a slide that contains some of the people that provided money and Mark's going to tell me off for not having the NRSP slide up there. But on that note, thank you.